<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, that was probably really gross. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Vampire Book Club, the podcast where we promise to read one book and then read a completely different book. I'm Charlie. And I'm Jamie. And uh, as you can see, we are not doing the Italian. No. Like we promised. Um, through, you know, due to, I would say, a very understandable concatenation of circumstances, which included me being ill, very ill. Um, if you hear me coughing, that's what that is. And uh, Jamie not reading it. I didn't uh, read it. I, <laughs> I didn't read it. <laughs> so we're here with uh, The Queen of Spades. A shorter by, story. A shorter story, which we did read, uh, by Alexander Pushkin. It's just a different... It's just... It's just. We just thought it would be easier because we had an assessment. Mm-hmm. I was ill. And that's also why we're a week late. But anyway, yeah. We're back. We're back with this story. Mm-hmm. And we're ready to there tell is content. you. There is content. And we're ready to tell you all about it. And we have done, you'll be excited to know, a little bit more prep <laughs> than we normally do. So hopefully, hopefully this will go... A bit smoother. A bit smoother. Right. So before we get going, like, what did you know about this story before we read it? Absolutely nothing. I had never heard of the <laughs> Queen of Spades um, I'd never heard of Alexander Pushkin until our lecturer informed me about him and his story. So I had I, I didn't know anything about it until I read it. Yeah, me neither. And it's weird because I was actually like reading a load of um, academic papers just to get some some things to say um, <laughs> <laughs> without having to come up with my own ideas. Um, and it's like it's considered to be like one of the most written about stories like in academia oh is it but, yeah oh i did not get that there were so from... many like papers that were just like i know i'm writing another p- essay on alexander pushkin what, what are you gonna say what are you gonna do oh my gosh they were all like punning it it's <laughs> all like the same few people maybe the, the story's just got a few dedicated fans just <laughs> writing solely about the no queen apparently of spades. everyone's writing about the queen of spades everyone's talking about the queen of spades yeah everyone is <laughs> and we've never heard of it no uh, i don't mi- I don't know, listeners. Listeners, we have some listeners now, so you can write in and tell us if you had heard of it <laughs> and what your impressions of it were, because we clearly lived under some kind of rock to not have heard it. But anyway, yeah, that was our impressions of it. Uh-huh. It's basically a story about, and I should have written out an easy way of how to say this, because last time it didn't go well and it took 45 <laughs> minutes, and I had to edit it all out because it was just bullshit. But it's basically about... A guy named Herman... Who is who, German. Who is German. Or is he? Or is he? We'll come to that. A guy named Herman who is German in Russia and he discovers that this there's this countess who has a secret to winning at gambling and he never gambles because he's like really just a bit of a stick in the mud. <laughs> And, um, but then he like hears that this countess like has this like magic secret um, to gambling, which will like ensure that like he wins um, a load of money. And so the story is basically about him trying to find the secret and his kind of slow descent into madness as he tries to uncover this this mystical secret that he believes will help him become really rich and successful. Um. That went well. That was so quick. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> that was so quick. A very concise explanation. It is a really short story, so maybe that has something to do with it. Um, yeah, so that is what it's about. And without wasting any more time, let's talk about it. So we'll start with the characters. Obviously, the the, the sort of three main characters that we need to know about. Um, Herman obviously the main character there's the countess who supposedly holds the secret and then there is uh oh, I don't, is it lisa vetter 
Lizavetta. I'm Lizavetta. not sure. It's probably not that. In fact, somebody in my se- uh, seminar ca- calling her Liz, which was irritating me for like, every reason. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like Liz- Lizavetta. Let's, let's... Lizavetta. We'll say that. <coughs> we'll go with that. It's like Friedrich. And I'm sure this again. is going to irritate somebody because I'm. We're probably saying it ex- extremely incorrectly. But again, if if you're out there, please write in and tell us how to say it. <laughs> we're here. We're o- we're open. We're wrong all the time. And we know there are people listening. We have at least forty six listeners. So this is your fault uh, <laughs> if we get it wrong. Um, um, so yeah, Lisa Vetter, who is the Countess's companion kind of character she seems to be in her yeah she's in the council's employees so basically keep her company and is supposed to be being paid for this role but kind of isn't and is sort of like left in this sort of status of like a financial anxiety anyway we'll start with herman herman the german and when i was reading a load of all of these essays people kept referring to him as just german but spelt like herman like with a double n and oh, it was okay. really confusing and i was like is there a whole character that i've missed out whose name is german because <sighs> that would be really weird if there was a character named herman who was a german and a character called german anyway yeah herman is what we'll be calling him mm. and he what do you what do you think of herman um <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> I think i've got no strong opinions about herman thus far as I don't have to spend an entire novel with him. Um, <laughs> but I think that he frightened an old lady to death, which isn't, you know, great. But also I question the the integrity of a man who's driven to madness after a, a, a little winking card. A, 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 little, little, a little wink from a card. A little, a little wink from a card. Who hasn't got one of those before? I think, I think, yeah, I mean, my sense of Herman is that he's just really lame. Mm-hmm. Like, he seems to be, I imagine him as, like, a sort of nerd who, like, if you, some for for whatever reason, mm-hmm. ended up, like, going back to his, I assume it would be his parents' house, and he took you into his bedroom, which he had in his parents' house, he would introduce you to his room by saying something along the lines of, welcome to my world. <laughs> That's the kind of- that's the vibe I get from Herman. Have you got a casting for Herman? Uh, oh, that's a good question, actually. Um, oh, oh, let me think about it. If this is too on the spot, then you can uh, maybe come back with it at the end. Someone, someone who's like, someone who's like really like chiselled, but not in like an attractive way. In that way that he's just like, he's just not got enough like flesh, oh. like on his <laughs> skin, like, like on his like bones. He's just like really like very uh, taut. Yeah, like taut a bit, kind of like a. He's a soldier, cooking. isn't he? He's an he's an engineer. So, but again, I, I, I'm no, not no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no show. Gorsh is out there. <laughs> very impressive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who, who I don't know who I would get to play Herman. Maybe like. Maybe like Jesse Eisenberg, but even Jesse Eisenberg, <laughs> I feel like is too cool. To be. Yeah, no, I think Jesse Eisenberg is is quite cool. I would say. Yeah. <laughs> it's in the air. It's in the air to be answered. <laughs> Maybe like Paul Paul Dano. I don't know who Paul Dano is. Yeah, you do. We went to see Batman the other day. Oh my god, I do know who Paul Dano is. Yeah. <laughs> of course I do. Paul Dano, of course. <laughs> no, I'm not sure if I would uh would cast Paul Dano as poor old Herman. I think we're doing him a disservice. <laughs> undue diligence here. We are. We are. Um, Lizaveta. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm moving <laughs> on to Do you not, Is that all we have to say about Paul Herman? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what, do you, what would you say to the decision that he makes? Like, Because his first statement that we ever hear from him, the first scene is like, the officers are all like playing cards in the barracks. Mm. Except for Herman, who is just watching, but it's like really late at night, it's like four o'clock in the morning, he'll just stay up watching these officers play card games and not join in, he'll just like sit there in silence. And then one of the officers, Tomsky, who is the Countess's nephew, son, grandson, something like that. Yeah. Set, like, is, is talking about Herman and being like, oh, well, Herman's really sensible because he never spends any money. And Herman says, I should have found the quote, Herman says, I, I'm going to find the quote. <laughs> going to find the quote because otherwise I will just not make any sense of it. It's really in the beginning. Yes, I found it. He says, I am not in... He says... <clears throat> I'll, I'll go from the beginning of the sentence. That okay. makes sense. He says, play interests me very much, said Herbert, but I am not in the position to sacrifice the necessary in the hopes of winning the superfluous. 
And then he immediately goes and stakes his whole life on this kind of like yeah mystery yeah this like, <laughs> like fable essentially and he's because it's yeah it's not very believable no the story that tomsky tells yeah he's he's sort of um positioned as somebody initially with quite a lot of like rationality that just like is it's completely upended by the um story's conclusion and i do think it's that sort of like upending that also is why he goes mental yeah he's just he's just like he's just such a conspiracy theorist like yeah he's just like this weird incel conspiracy theorist is the vibe i get from herman yeah a very weird man very strange a very strange man but because uh, i don't think of him as being at all attractive like from from the like description that pushkin kind of i think we mostly get like descriptions of his eyes like his staring at we never uh, get a physical description of him but like his character doesn't make him seem like he would be a handsome character we only get are you doing physiognomics you're right (laughs) (laughs) no yeah yes i am (laughs) charlie buys into physiognomics everyone i'm a a victorian quack (laughs) (laughs) by Um, his uh moral decisions he seems to me an (laughs) ugly man well we only ever get descriptions of his eyes and like when lisa vess is like kind of like he's got his like uh collar like popped which again lame <laughs> and then he's got and he's got his like cap like pulled down so she could only see like one sparkling eye mm-hmm. and it's just like it's, you kind of can't really see like maybe if she'd seen him she wouldn't have <laughs> taken the time <laughs> to write to him because yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean well she really doesn't want to write to him initially no she doesn't but she's somehow charmed at his face like again, he kind of stalks this is weird okay we're gonna have to go over this part of the plot basically in order to gain access to the countess who has this secret Herman decides to s- stalk essentially stalk the house where he discovers L- Lisa Vetter and he's like I'll woo her and gain access to the house through that but he does it in a really weird way he starts basically just by like standing outside yeah for hours on end and just staring at her yeah like he doesn't really like i don't know like if i was trying to woo someone and he he says like i'm on a time frame as well he's like because uh, if i woo the countess this will take too long yeah i'm gonna go for her companion like he doesn't like seek her out when she's out in the street like he just stands outside her window yeah. and doesn't say anything and stares and st- which i don't think is that <laughs> desirable it's extremely predatory <laughs> very predatory very like but also like where's the logic there <laughs> too as well which is uh, big on our sort of comparison of Herman to uh, an apparition or a ghost and uh, the Countess to a member of the undead which we will talk about in a minute when we talk yeah. about the uncanny but like yeah like Lisa Vetta has a lot to answer for her because I feel like if you're taken in by this mm-hmm she's also i have it and i'm sure i've made this comparison before but like she's i'm sure i've made a comparison before to the joker in our uh, podcast (laughs) but again she reminds me a little bit of you know the walking phoenix uh the walking phoenix the walking phoenix walking phoenix is um uh most recent joke i have no clear walking whacking no i'm gonna say walking whacking doesn't seem right. Doesn't sound right either. I'm saying walk him. Mr. Walk him. Phoenix. Mr. Phoenix. <laughs> Mr. Phoenix Mr. is. Jay Phoenix. Uh, yeah, Mr. J. <gasps> yeah, 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 Joker. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Oh, anyway, <laughs> Mr. J. Phoenix's most recent uh, Joker movie, where he has just like a comically bad day, is sort of reminiscent to me of like Lizaveta, <laughs> the fact that like she's like, oh, I've been, you know. I'm just always confronted by etiquette, but never sort of like invited into like the actual sort of like social element of things. I'm in this constant sort of like almost circus with my old, 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 old benefactor who makes me do all sorts of shit and then doesn't pay me. Doesn't pay me. Like she's just got no luck. She's, She's got just no got luck. no luck whatsoever. No, because it says, like, there's that bit where it's like, oh, 
when it's kind of descri- describing like how shit her life is and kind of saying like oh she longed for a man to like take away but like when she goes to balls with the countess like no one does with her because even though she's be- more beautiful than everyone else she's yeah. really poor and so mm-hmm. <laughs> everyone just ignores her and yeah. she's just kind of left in this weird like solitary sad <laughs> tragic yeah. existence where she has to look up at this mad countess yeah and so I suppose, I suppose, yeah. If, if a guy did start stalking, you might be like, "Well, fuck it, this can't be any worse." Yeah, this I would. Do you know what? Worse. If I was as a veteran and somebody started stalking me, I'd probably be like, "Well, at least there's something to do that isn't <laughs> that isn't <laughs> get Be's like being stalked is yeah, something to do. <laughs> isn't just being mind broken by this old woman, which is what's happening to her. <laughs> there's a big long section of where that essentially happens to her." Yeah, yeah, God, that's a really that's like one of the longest sections yeah. like, of the entire of the entire story. Story is just describing how shit. She got her getting hazed life. by the countess. Yeah, she's just like being forced to like run around and after her get the carriage, and then she doesn't want the carriage because it's too cold or whatever, and then <laughs> forcing her to go and change. Poor Lisa, Poor but Lisa. she yeah. So maybe that's why I think that yeah, she's quite quite a. I would say she, she ends up quite well in this, but but she's she quiet. dodges the bullet that is Herman. <laughs> she does <laughs> dodge the bullet that is Herman because he's after the Countess. Yeah, he care about her. He's kind of after her a little bit though. I think. Do you think? I think there is that bit where um, there's that bit where he sees her in the window and he is taken aback by her beauty. So I think his his um. I, I can't argue this from like a real quoted standpoint, but like I do think he had some form of interest in her. He also didn't have to go back and be like, by the way, I've accidentally just killed the. Uh, yeah, he didn't have to go and find her. And yeah, tell her and tell her the truth as well. He could have just been like, I heard something terrible happening in the room, and yeah. I could have just poked my and I put my head in, and she'd like you know she'd fallen over like dead, and then he still could have had her. He, he came in and told the truth, hence why it's sort of like this weird. Like, he's very dedicated to, I don't know, like, this odd sort of... There's sort of a, 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 logi- a, a logician? Is that the word I'm looking for? Like, a, 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 like a logic to him that is just gets completely unraveled by the uh, story's end. Hence why he goes It gets mad. completely unraveled by the story's end. And like we were saying earlier, like, he is just completely taken for all of his kind of, like... He's described as, like, being really Napoleonic mm-hmm. and, like, this kind of, like, sort of monkish restraint constantly by everyone and then is completely taken in by this like magic card he's, he's always referred to as well in sort of reference to other things I've, I noticed as well where we don't get like a like a clear cut description of what he looks like or anything like that but we get like like you said the fact that he is Napoleonic or um, and comparing him to Mephistopheles I'm so glad I said that right <laughs> uh, 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 I glanced down at the plan and I was like, I'm just gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna fudge it up. To be fair, but I, I didn't... haven't spelled it right there. <laughs> Mephistopheles. <laughs> yeah. Mephistopheles. Um but yeah, he's always he's always described in sort of relation to other things. He's never really given his own description, which also adds to his ghost like yeah. Presence. Neither is Lisa Vest is just described as being beautiful. The yeah. only person who we get a kind of hard and fast description of is the, the countess. countess, and it's grotesque. Yeah. <laughs> tell me, tell me what you think about the countess. I think the countess is great. I, I think, think countess is goals. The countess <laughs> is goals. I mean, perhaps in the fact that she's just like uh, um, an not just an eccentric old lady, but like a. I don't know, like an extremely rich, fucked up looking old lady. Perhaps it isn't goals for her to uh, b- box the ear of a uh, box the ear of her husband um, when he wouldn't pay her because she'd essentially gone and gambled all their money away. But um, <laughs> yeah. I can uh, I can respect the audacity uh, to believe that she was owed the money in the first place I, from her husband <laughs> I think who was like it's wonderful. like detailed that it's like the effect she has on men is like he is like he was ter- like her husband was terrified of her uh, in the paragraph where Tomsky is explaining um, the countess's uh, 
uh, how she happened to garner her wealth in the first place. There's a there's a bit where I think it's talking about her sleeping with somebody um, and it made the man want to blow his brains out when he she left or something like that. So she's, constant, she's constantly... Yeah, uh, there's like... Yeah, because like, that's a bit weird, actually. I was just... Yeah, now you said that. Because like, Tomsky's like, at the beginning, is like telling the story to all of these, these soldiers who are sitting around playing cards about the, how about this card trick that she knows um, and kind of goes on for quite a long time about how amazingly hot his, grand- his grandmother was. was yeah. And like how she was described as like the Muscovite Venus in her day. And yeah. kind of like, you know, she went to Paris and she was like loved by all the gentlemen. She had a had an affair with like Cardinal Richelieu and and uh, like yeah. the, the Count of Saint Germain or whatever. And, you know, all, all of this like amazing, like like how just how hot she must have been. <laughs> She's quite the shagger in her day. He's really... Like, he- yeah, before he even gets to like the actual story which is just that she basically blew all her money Mm -hmm. and then the Count Saint Germain told her this card trick and she won it all back which is basically the story and he spends ages talking about just how hot she was exactly (laughs) and how like I suppose contextualising that uh, how she got in with the Count Germain and uh, needed the, the card trick in the first place but he could have cut out the fact you know the bits, where, the bits where the bits where his grandma was like you know shagging around and uh, shagging cardinals yeah and... shagging cardinals and like fucking up men's lives because it, like he she's clearly told him this as well I love that yeah <laughs> I actually had put that together I love that she's just like in my day I was hot but yeah that does that make it like unreliable then um that's m- actually m- an maybe that's actually actually let's come back to that question at the end because I think that's, like, relevant to the theme Mm -hmm. that we will end on. But keep that in your minds, listeners, as we are discussing this and decide how you feel about it. Mm -hmm. So, (coughs) excuse me, I'm still dying, I'm so weak. (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, Yeah, let's move on to talk about some of the themes, some of the ideas, the theory. So, thinking about little old Freud... Little Freud. Little Freud and the Uncanny. Our favourite friend, Freud. Our favourite friend. Um, ha- like, the Countess and Herman, like, are kind of, like, presented, like, throughout the story as being these kind of... There's sort of, like, this uncanny element to both of them. Um, and so, let's talk about, like, Herman for should a Should we describe again. what uncanny is? Or should we we just should, yeah, let's, to... let's do that. Let's go on to... Let's, let's, let's go take a step back. We're serving Think back. about the theory of the uncanny. Jamie, you're probably better at describing what the uncanny is than I am. Oh, I can give it a brief, a brief shot. Um, I couldn't tell you. I believe he, uh, Freud has an entire series of essays on the uncanny, or a big essay, um that's obviously tied in with his thoughts on um, dream work theory and like id ego and super ego and all the rest of it. But it's uh, the idea of the uncanny is sort of like the visitation of uh, repressed, repressed feelings, memories, inclinations upon a person. That's what that's what the uncanny is to the extent that like the familiar becomes the unfamiliar or the Heimlich becomes yeah, it's the kind unheimlich. Of, yeah, it's kind of basically a sense of uh yeah, like so, that some like that there's something not quite right about this thing that you're experiencing or looking at or whatever. So a good example of that might be like the Uncanny Valley, which kind of took this idea and ran with it with the sense of like when you see like uh like uh robots that are like designed to look like humans or like kind of humanoid things or kind of like waxworks and stuff like that like they're kind of feeling of like that something isn't quite right about it because it looks like a human but it's not Mm. um that kind of sense of like there's something wrong with this and kind of freud's whole idea was that like you feel that way because you're like jamie said like imparting some kind of repressed fear or desire or something onto it and he talked a lot about eyes and castration he somehow linked them together in his mind <laughs> <laughs> which i think says more about freud than anyone else but we will talk about relevance to this because it it, it is yeah, relevant uh, the theory of like eyes like play a big part in this but before we do like we'll talk about herman and kind of like he, we've kind of touched on this a bit how he's kind of 
not we're, we're never really given like a physical description of him kind of all all of the descriptions that we get of him are kind of in relevance reference to something else kind of the way he kind of behaves like his kind of sparkling eyes and like the the fact that that's kind of all that Lisa Vetter can see like when she first kind of sees him you know his kind of his kind of behavior which is never really like we very rarely like go into Herman's head mm. in fact I don't think we ever really do we don't spend much time like understanding his motives in a way like the only thing we ever hear from him is that he doesn't gamble because he doesn't think it's sensible with the amount of money that he has um, he's got three and then he, crimes. He's got three crimes on his conscience. Is a uh, constantly brought up. D- <laughs> he's got three crimes. Oh on his yeah, conscience. yeah. There's like, no, but that's like a rumor that goes around about him. That's oh no, he doesn't actually, actually give it to us, does he? No, he that's like says. that's not him. Like that's not that's not even the kind of omniscient narrator kind of saying that. That's I think Tomsky like says that about him. Yeah. And like you know he's described as being like uh like napoleon like mephistopheles like all of these random kind of characters um that don't that you can't really like pin him down uh and and where he is and sort of this sense you can't that hold he's, herman down you can't you can't hold you just herman can't, down. and you shouldn't you <laughs> yeah. should let let him fly um, <laughs> <laughs> let him soar uh, um yeah like he kind of has this sort of animalistic quality to him at points kind of the way like we were talking about earlier like the way he kind of goes about wooing Lizaveta isn't really to go about wooing her Mm -hmm. but to sort of stalk her like she's a gazelle and he's Mm -hmm. like a lion or something like and yeah again we're never we're never like we never see into their relationship together. They only kind of communicate through letters and like this is supposedly how like Lizaveta falls for him but like we never actually hear what the contents of those letters are, so we don't know like even what he's saying to kind of yeah. Well, we we uh, there are like um, a description of a couple of bits where one he sort of like steals his passion from uh, his expression of passion from like a German uh, poem, mm. um, and then he starts to write. I think in his own sort of poetry to her in German that's just sort of like suffused with his passions and all the rest of it and i think but it's again in, in that same sort of like vague sense where it's like you just got to believe that this was passionate enough to for these things to start happening which is very uh prevalent i think within certain patches of the gothic <laughs> yeah <laughs> and certainly herman does yeah lisa Vesic, maybe the reason she kind of gets away with it is because it's like in the doesn't. monk where they were like ambrosia just gave the bestest most holy speech ever uh, yeah, we never we're, hear it. Yeah, when I hit you, like it's too like I couldn't. I personally uh, couldn't couldn't write this holy <laughs> speech, but like it was super holy and it's like, basically moved like everyone. Tenacious D is the greatest song in the world. Yeah, it is. It's exactly <laughs> like that. Herman's the greatest love letter in the yeah. world. We never hear about it. <laughs> Managed to convince a woman who he was openly stalking <laughs> to fall in love with him through this one letter. We don't know what it says. Um, so yeah, he kind of has this kind of it's 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 difficult as as you've probably noticed how we are struggling to kind of describe Herman in any kind of tangible sense um yeah he kind of presents this sort of James word apparition yes this kind of ghostly kind of figure who essentially does literally like pass through walls at one point yeah well not literally but (laughs) figuratively yeah I didn't think about that yeah you're right um yeah it's in the way that he as well appears in front of the uh the countess like he he literally just appears in front of her i think that's even the word that the if if not if that's not what it says verbatim it's certainly described in that manner that he doesn't like step out he's he's just in in front of her and in the same way he's almost he almost you know kills her without touching her in a way that's mm, quite ghostly that's, too that's like he's one, he's yeah. almost frightens the life out of her yeah quite literally or you know what i mean just like sort of for, if for whatever reason he is the one that does kill her i think that's like unquestionable he's he's killed her um or at least i think the narrative wants us to believe that he's definitely responsible for he's responsible death. for it yeah um but he doesn't touch her he has the he has the gun but nonetheless he, he's still she still dies because of his presence not because of anything he physically does to her yeah yeah that's um, a good point i hadn't actually thought about that mm, that's a good one um his uh his sort of like ghostliness is tied into 
the way he's sort of able to uncannily haunt the same spots, like the one spot he's taking up standing outside of the window. Also, he's a ghost because hasn't he got anything better to do? You, 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 you've led me to believe he's got a job, Pushkin, as an engineer. <laughs> like, how, how has yeah. he got all this time to stand outside his, this girl's window and stare at her? Like, yeah. Yeah, full time goes part time engineer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and kind of the way that sort of the characters kind of mythologize him in this way, mm. it kind of just lends this kind of he's just he's just he's just a weird guy. He's kind of transformed into this sort of spectre uh-huh. um, that people are very obviously very uncertain of. Like what? Like when Tomsky kind of describes him as Mephistopheles, like that's a very that that's taking it quite like Napoleon. That's that's kind of like a kind of topical reference for yeah. time. But Mephistopheles, yeah, like describing him essentially like being like he's the devil. Uh huh. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, he's a uh, yeah. and he says it quite off off handedly, and I'm like I. I'm really annoyed that those two women kind of distract Tomsky because I'm just like, I, I want to know why you think this. Yeah, like, why, what he's possibly to... done to be described as in sort of like in infernal terms. Like, not just like, <laughs> he's a bad guy, he's a bad man. Like, yeah. he's this guy's like fucking Mephistopheles. Do not get involved with him. And like, but I, I don't think I see any sort of, sort of Mephistophelian behavior from him. No. I understand that he like, you know, he's he's greedy and he scares a woman an old woman to death by sort of like wielding a pistol in front of her. But he does come back in well, and it was like the pistol wasn't loaded. Like I'm sorry that I've just killed I've literally just killed her like to well, Yeah, that's the, th- well, that's the thing is that Tomsky obviously sees him as Mephistopheles when this is kind of quite clearly like you can very easily like draw a lot of I don't know how intentional this was but like you could obviously draw a lot of parallels to Faust another German story obviously made famous by Christopher Marlowe's Dr. Faustus in which Mephistopheles is kind of the main character not well apart from Dr. Faustus (laughs) 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 the main character Dr. Faustus and then Mephistopheles is kind of like the devil that uh, Dr. Faustus makes this deal with and in the same way like obviously Dr. Faustus kind of wants sort of you know he wants to be super powerful you know and to be really successful as a magician um, and have all this like power and wealth and blah 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 Herman obviously wants to be like super rich and kind of like I mean, it's never like it's never like explicitly said like he wants power, but there's obviously like gestures towards. Oh, like, definitely. Because he, he's rubbing shoulders like with royalty, essentially. Yeah. And he's kind of like this this sort of engineer who's kind of like rich enough to to be in that circle, but not rich enough to actually like be one of them. And so yeah, he kind of like fixates on on this card trick as as his way of getting that, just as as just as Doctor Faustus does, of getting his soul. So there's obviously like quite clear elements to draw between the two tales mm-hmm. um but for but like the fact that in 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 the world of these characters that he doesn't present as dr faustus he presents as mephistopheles yeah is like what have you been doing well, I suppose as like- well, in the sense that like i do think he's also he's he's both like the the, the story about count uh germain like there is that sort of implication there that what he's looking for as well is the secret to eternal life like he's also looking looking for that um mm. from her and that's what he's so desperate to get to like yeah. the fact that you know it's eter- wealth and eternal life are sort of like very closely uh linked in this tale in that that's sort of implied i think that what he's searching for is um is that secret that yeah. he that's that she hasn't given to anyone apart from that one young man this yeah, she, she takes pity on. <laughs> well, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, we will talk about the kind of concept of like commodity and like immortality as being like very intrinsically linked in this. Mm. But yeah, no, I do agree that like, even though he it never says like this is what you're looking for, there are constant allusions throughout the text to the kind of um, idea of uh, like immortality. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like yeah in a very like literal way um and this might be a good time to start talking about the countess uh who uh, is old as balls <laughs> yeah she's very very old, old. as balls um and <clears throat> i don't i don't know i uh, when i was talking about this in my seminars a lot of people were kind of like there's a lot of ambiguity around her age i don't i didn't see that when i read it i mm. think her age kind of adds up quite quite well i think there's like a lot of 
there's like a lot of discussion about oh she's in her 80s blah 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 she's really old you know there's kind of like th- th- it's, there's so much reference to her being old that it kind of seems like maybe she might might be older i guess you could maybe read into sort of that idea of it yeah but like herman i don't know how he knows actually he says that she's 87 yeah quite clearly don't know how he knows that um another does she has he about him. Does yeah it, i think it's does he say that he knows i can't recall the part you're talking about but i'll believe you well maybe i'm maybe i Maybe May- I'm misremembering it. Someone I, I probably it, definitely I read says. it last week. Yeah. Someone definitely says she's 87. Okay. I thought it was Herman. Could be wrong. Again, listeners, please correct me. <laughs> um, or don't. Because <laughs> it doesn't matter now because we've already recorded it. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah. she's so, so someone definitely says she is 87. And then it's like, 60 years ago, this is when she, like, had this big adventure in Paris and, like, learned the lesson, which would make her 27. I don't think that's that ambi- ambiguous. <laughs> I think that makes sense. However, I have spoken to a lot of people who do feel that her age is kind of, like, potentially questionable. And obviously she is constantly being described as, like, super, super old. And so when you think, oh, is she 87? Maybe you can read into that a bit more. Um, and she's obviously very concerned with, like looking young Young. and she's very much like stuck in the past like she wears like the fashions of like 60 years ago whatever like you know the massive wigs and the the massive dresses and whatever we were talking though about how what we're actually interested in is the not like how old she is but like how alive is she and as well (laughs) using sort of like youth to signify aliveness and that that on an old aging nearly dead <laughs> body is the thing that's creating the sense of the uncanny with yeah, her. Yeah, it's a very abject kind of... Disc- like, she's kind of like... She is literally Martin dressed as lamb, but she's like this old woman dressed up <laughs> as a young woman from 60 years ago. Like, she's kind of like... It's... There's... You know, she... And she kind of, like, makes allusions to it herself. Like, she obviously... She doesn't want to, like, move on in her own, like, sense of self from when she was, like, well, 27, we assume. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> she kind of says, like, oh, like, she asked Tomsky to, like, bring her a book at one point, but she doesn't want a modern book. She wants, like, you know, one in the style of, like, a book that was written 60 years ago. And, you know, she goes to balls and she stays out till two in the morning and she powders her face and does all this, like, has all these makeups and, you know, designs her whole house around, you know, this kind of decade that sort of doesn't exist anymore and yeah it kind of like the reason that this is relevant the reason that i'm trying to kind of find a kind of smooth way into it <laughs> failing miserably is uh because the way that she is described like the kind of way that she's made into sort of this repulsive character is kind of if not vampiric then at very least undead there's yeah. a lot of like coding in there for that even if you know not necessarily saying she is a vampire but like she's 100% under uh you know undead coded or like sat within the same sort of realm as dracula in in terms of like the description of her aristocratic spaces and Mm. the sort of strangeness of her body yeah, which is described in, in too much detail, I yeah. think. The only one of the characters who really gets any sort of description is is the Countess. And it's, mm-hmm. it basically is when, you know, you're kind of getting her... You kind of... She, there's a description of her when she's kind of all dressed up and then there's a description of her when uh, Herman is hiding in her bedroom and is watching her undress in this, again, like, very predatory sort of way. Um, and kind of, like... You know, it describes like her swollen ankles and her kind yeah. of yellow jaundiced skin and like how like you know she w- once all of the kind of the the uh, fineries are off. Fi- yeah, she kind of becomes this kind of like vacant shell where she's kind of like just sort of sat there like rocking herself and sort of humming mm-hmm. absentmindedly um, before he kind of comes out and like surprises her. And so, yeah, like, it's, 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 she's, like, she's the only one who gets any real description. And it's it's made into this really, like, c- horrible kind of grotesque thing. Like, yeah. she's kind of meant to be kind of repulsive and sort of sort of abject in that way. Like, that sort of... There is this moment as well, sort of, like, following when she sort of, like, sheds her 
ornamentation that says, um, in this costume, more suitable to her age, she appeared less hideous and deformed. And the costume that she's getting into is her like nightgown and her like nightcap or whatever. She's like preparing to sleep as well. And then in the in the same section, it also describes her as like sleepless in the same way that all old people are um, as well. And this like uh, I think I think it's making an allusion to sort of like the link between like sleep and death. And in her sleeplessness as well, uh, definitely positioning her as, I suppose, figuratively, which is what she is anyway, but like undead, like the, in this in this idea that like she's preparing to sleep but is unable to. Yeah, yeah, like the kind of concept of like she looks more, le- she looks less disgusting. Yeah, in when her... she's getting when she's when she's getting ready to go to sleep Mm -hmm. this kind of death-like state that seems more natural on her and yet she's kind of in this that's a great way of describing it (laughs) (laughs) that's exactly how I wanted to describe it Um, and then yeah is is kind of you know this somnambulist you kind of can't really access that really that we see anyway Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. she's allowed to because he ends up killing her it, it, I guess in that way it makes sense like because you know she looks like she's dead and then she dies <laughs> the moment um, of her death I think is very odd as well because reading it it's like the countess said nothing and you're like she's just dead she's dead she's dead she's dead and then it says like the countess like makes one last face like or like grimace or whatever she like she like puts her hands up to like shield herself, herself. from his gun, gun which isn't loaded but she didn't know that or he said and then loaded. she she like freezes motionless and like falls to the ground. Yeah, like, again, another like, Scooby Doo beat. Yes, <laughs> but like in reading it, preceding that part, it just is like the Countess doesn't say anything, and you're like, she's dead, she's dead, she's, she's just dead. Died. In the same way that the narrative is constantly just being like, is she dead or alive? Is she dead or alive? Mm. She's very close to death. Like she's so close to death, so that, does it even matter? And then it does matter. On yeah, it. exactly. Yeah. yeah. People, even like, even like fucking Herman, like when he's like trying to convince her to tell him the secret, he's like, "You're gonna die soon anyway. You've not got long to live." Yeah. Like, Ew. You might as well tell me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, um. So yeah, those are our two kind of uncanny characters. Alongside those, we have some kind of uncanny supernatural-esque elements. Mm -hmm. So should we talk about those? Yes. So there's kind of the sense... First, So first of all, like, the the main one, I guess, that people might think of is the the winking card. Mm -hmm. Basically, the Countess, as a ghost, (laughs) returns to Herman and tells him the secret... She said, "What is the secret again? It's like three seven eight. Three seven eight. Three seven eight. Three seven eight. Those, those, those are the cards you have to play." She also says that she doesn't. She didn't want to visit upon him. Like it wasn't her idea, which was also slightly ominous. Seeing that there's some other force that's making her come and and tell him this. Yeah, and in reference to like references to the devil and like the concept of yeah. soul, I guess yeah, that is pretty spooky. <laughs> Yeah, now that I think about it, I guess the Countess's ghost is the big one rather than the winky card. But <laughs> but anyway, the Countess's ghost appears. She tells him the secret. Three, seven, eights. She says, this is the cards you need to play in order to win. You have to play on three consecutive nights and then you're never allowed to play again. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't really explain further than that, but it's like, that's it. You'll, you'll win all the money and then you can't ever play the game again. You can't go near it. That's it. So, so there's this kind of like this element of prophecy in the, you know, there's kind of it's not just like there's this secret magical card trick. It's like there are supernatural rules that go along with it that have to be followed in or, in order for it to kind of work successfully. Yeah. And the kind of the 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 notion that he is sort of cursed in the end when he kind of it doesn't work for him. He plays He plays the three one night, it works. He plays the seven the next night, it works. He's going to go back, he's going to play the ace. It's instead, like, the card... Like, it's described in this very weird way. So it kind of makes out that the cards themselves trick him into playing the wrong card. So he's trying to play an ace. He thinks he's played an ace, then he turns over the card and it turns out to be the queen of spades. Hence the name of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and... 
that's the moment when the card he he looks at the card and he's like oh my god i played the wrong card and the card supposedly like he sees the card the queen of spades wink at him and he's like oh my god it looks like the countess like this is the countess in a card <laughs> from beyond the grave winking at me and she's done me over maybe we should talk about as well why winking like why a wink I think we will. This, okay, we will talk okay. about that. We will talk about that in a minute. Right. Okay. But <laughs> speeding ahead. <laughs> speeding ahead. But it is relevant. It is relevant because it's. I think a wink is a creepy thing to do anyway. I think a wink is a creepy thing to do. <laughs> don't wink at people, guys. Don't go out and wink at people. I don't think it's ever appropriate. Don't wink. Let's stop winking. I can't even wink. So. Yeah, and can't she can't. It. I can't do it. <laughs> I just tried. <laughs> Jamie can confirm I cannot wink. Um, so there's all these kind of like supernatural spooky elements. Oh yeah, when he goes to see the body of the Countess afterwards. Another wink. Uh, she apparently also winks him again. He kind of like falls back and is like, you know, horrified yep. by this. And is ultimately like driven mad by this whole experience. So yeah, there's all these, these like cr- creepy kind of supernatural elements. But obviously... He ends up mad at the end, and so it's it's kind of like, well, is it is it real? Is it in his head? There's an extent to which you kind of, like, end up questioning it, because if you kind of think about it in any kind of logical terms, mm. you're kind of like, well, very realistic. Like, he's the only one who ever sees this. He ends up sectioned at the end, yeah. um, kind of muttering away to himself about this. About Three, seven, this, ace. Three seven queen um, <laughs> is what he spends the rest of his life talking about, mm-hmm. um, and like y- you know, you can kind of be like, okay, well, this is this is obviously just this is all just in his head. He's gotten taken up by this sort of conspiracy supernatural idea, and you know, he's had a mental breakdown, and this is the result of it. And there was never any kind of su- secret thing there's never any like you know mystery or whatever it's just all in his head but he doesn't play the thing for me is like but he doesn't play the ace no he plays the queen of spades and the thing is is that he plays the queen of spades and loses because the ace won so the secret was true yeah but just not for him yeah, he didn't. He didn't because he because he actually he accidentally plays it. But like he wins on the three, he wins on the seven, and then he would have won if he had played the ace. So like, the secret would have would have been true if he hadn't been kind of tricked in this way into playing the wrong card, mm-hmm. which I guess is his own fault. But at the same time, yeah, like yeah, like there's another that you just end, it's just the story. I think quite cleverly like just makes you question like how much of this is real. Yeah. And the logic of the way the story works, like, does that very well, I think. We're also talking structurally as well, the presence of threes. Mm. Because of three, seven, ace, which obviously starts with three, is made up of three um, items, I suppose. There is 34, I believe. Yep, 34 mentions of uh, the word three in the text. It's things like three, I think, three chambermaids... On the third day, three days have passed. Three. He's wearing a tricorn. He's hat. wearing a tricorn hat. Many, many references, just in the narrative to threes, like things happening in in threes, and I think the prevalence of that is interesting. It certainly if, lends itself yeah. to the kind of prophetic. Oh, definitely, and I think as well in the way that the the three seven ace begins to mutate for him even before he goes like mad you know what i mean like he just he uh he he's walking down the street i can't remember the exact part but people are doing things that reminding him of threes or he looks at an ace and he sees a spider there's already this sort of like um i don't know this this sort of instability attached to the presence of three seven ace before he Mm. has the sort of like moment where he goes mad like yeah like the world is already conspiring against him yeah. to kind of w- within this sort of prophecy yeah this for sure. curse um and his own kind of madness mm-hmm. yeah so talked about the, a bit, a bit about the uncanny let's talk a bit about well i was gonna say the real world but the the title of the sections is commodity and immortality so that's obviously like yeah. <laughs> not, not super not super grounded in reality but like I found this as being interesting when I was reading it 
because I was like, at first I was reading it and I was like, oh, like, I like that finally I'm reading a, reading a story that's not just about sex and death. Mm-hmm. Um, now I'm In the reading, gothic? Yeah, yeah. Now I'm reading a story about kind of like greed or commodity or kind of like, I guess, I kind of always associate, you know, just in a kind of like pop criminology way of kind of like motivations either being about like sex or money Mm -hmm. um and so it's nice i was like this is nice to read a story about money and i'm i we will in a a section in a minute completely disavow all of that but (laughs) but for now but for now let's just focus let's just focus on the elements of greed and commodity because yeah like whereas whereas sex seems to have been associated seems to be within the gothic associated with death commodity and money and wealth is associated with immortality so there are lots of like different ways that this kind of like comes through in the story like from sort of within the imagery of like the countess's house which is like full of like objects like there's loads of kind of reference to her and all of the, all of her possessions, like surrounded by all of these possessions, like in her bedroom, all of like the weird things she owns, mm-hmm. and like the her toilet and all of her random her shit. bloody toilet, <laughs> bloody toilet, and sort of that is kind of linked to her sort of age and her sort of seeming immortality or kind of coded immortality. And then there's there's you know we've talked before about the kind of her links to kind of the Count of Saint-Germain and kind of the presence of the Count of Saint-Germain in the story as you know a real historical figure which I find quite interesting being linked to kind of supposedly he discovered the elixir of life and you know was supposedly like immortal shrouded in mystery Um, and apparently she knew him and like so there's kind of like as we've kind of discussed like always this question of like has has he has he just given her this secret this card trick or has he like also maybe like allowed her to live forever you don't you don't know Mm -hmm. um what was their relationship we're unsure yeah we know she slept around so uh hey hey Hey. (laughs) lecture of life baby but yeah so i just i just thought that that was interesting to read about those two things as being as being connected as opposed to sex and death which kind of Herman draws attention to himself because he kind of says when he's trying to convince her he makes this really weird connection between love death and that's why she should give him I'll I'll, I'll read out I'll read out the section Mm. he says he's trying to convince her he's broken into her bedroom uh he's she's not speaking and he says if your heart has ever known the passions of love, if you can remember its sweet, its sweet ecstasies, if you remember its rapture, if you have ever smiled on the cry of a newborn babe, if any human feelings have ever entered your breast, I entreat you by the feelings of a wife, a lover, a mother, uh, by all that is sacred in life, not to reject my prayer. Reveal to me your secret of what is it to you? Maybe it is connected with some terrible sin or the loss of eternal salvation. Um, with some... I've put margin there, but I think I don't think it's I don't think it's margin. Bargain, that's the one. With some <laughs> with some bargain with the devil. Reflect, you are old. You have not long to live. I am ready to take your sins upon my soul. Only reveal to me your secret. Remember that the happiness of a man is in your hands. Not only myself, but my children and my grandchildren will bless your memory as a saint. So I think this passage is really interesting because he out of nowhere starts talking about love which is not relevant at all he just says yeah if your heart has ever known the passion of love you should give me this Mm -hmm. why like that doesn't that doesn't follow yeah and then he immediately connects that like that concept of love with her death so like if you have ever loved you're about to die anyway so give me (laughs) give me this this secret secret. and it's not even about Um, a transference of like he's not give me he is robbing her he, this is, you know, this is a stick up, but he's not robbing her of her actual wealth, which is going to be too hard to like attain. Like he could, he, I suppose maybe he could, he could just like make her like sign something or whatever. But he's not robbing her of actual wealth. He's robbing her of like the secret to wealth. Yeah, which is like, and you know, he kind of doesn't really know like why she's not telling him. And kind of assumes that it must be because she's in some way cursed, and is like, well, I'm happy to take it. I'll take that curse. 
if you've ever known me. love. I just find it such a weird argument for him to be like, if you've ever known love acknowledge that you're about to die and give me the secret mm-hmm. so that I can be eternally wealthy. I also like to see it at the risk of like a oversimplification as like, he's like, oh my God, a get rich quick scheme. <laughs> because like, he has like the whole bit where, and I'm sorry for correcting you earlier. You were right that Herman is the one that mentions the count- the countess's age. Oh yeah. Because I just remember in that uh, bit where he's talking about, um, how he's going to access the secret, this, the, 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 uh, secret to pulling the three cards to make himself wealthy forever and he says oh i could become her lover he's like no shit that's gonna take too long like she's so old like she's 80 87 86 whatever he does say that and um but the the thing that stops him in his train of thought is that no this can't this this is an unreliable tale like i don't know if i completely believe what um tomsky's just told me and the thing instead of three seven ace that's gonna get me through is economy uh, temperance and industry so and you know he's like so if you compare the two sets economy temperance industry that's how he um believes he's going to make his wealth as opposed to three seven ace which is his supernatural get get rich quick scheme that he's got to throw sort of the emotional kitchen sink at the <laughs> at the countess to access that's a good point actually mm. that is a good point and yeah like how the way his his logic works is very interesting in that way because you're kind of like well that is right you probably will be richer by just being sensible with your money yeah and instead he take he takes that to mean i've got to be really smart about how i seduce this woman break into her house to rob this countess of this secret that i don't even know is real uh, <laughs> i love that idea as well of robbing a secret like that's such a yeah interesting idea yeah, he, like, I think... Like he's not robbing her of money. He's yeah, robbing no. her of the secret. Which is interesting. He doesn't think, like... Yeah, like, when Thomas is describing, my super rich, wealthy, vulnerable grandma, yeah. he doesn't think, I'm going to go rob this woman. Yeah. He thinks, I'm going to go and get this magical <laughs> secret. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it doesn't... His mind, like, doesn't work... His mind works in a very interesting way. Mm. One that I am frankly fascinated by. But... Yeah, kind of how he kind of associates kind of wealth with kind of like immortality. How he kind of even says, just now that I'm looking at it, when he's like, oh, if you tell me my children and my grandchildren will remember you as a saint. And so in that way, she will kind of achieve a sort of, he's kind of promising her yeah. a sense of immortality mm-hmm. if, he, if she gives him the secret. Yeah, like a deification, like I'll, you know, I'll render you a saint. Yeah. For the sake of this 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 mystery. You can be my personal saint lady if you just tell me how you did this. <laughs> you know, like I don't know, is this the bit that sort of precedes the um It's the bit well I Oh no, maybe it's connected with some terrible sin. Yeah. It's like I know that, you know, you've probably made some deal with the devil, so you can be my saint. Does that feel good? Does that feel good? You can be my saint. Yeah, and I guess also like how Yeah, that is actually interesting. I also like how like sort of that he kind of i kind of like i kind of see like you know in the sense that like they're both quite mysterious characters we don't you know the countess's past is like shrouded in in all this mystery you know herman as we've talked about endlessly is kind of like this kind of you know he can't really like pin down like who he is or like you know even what he is and kind of like he there's a sense that like he feels some sort of like kinship with her in that way like they kind of like have that sort of connection Mm. and his immediate thought is like oh well you've you've sold yourself to the devil Mm -hmm. or like you're cursed forever Mm -hmm. but he's also very happy to like take that on himself yes fucking herman (laughs) fucking herman um and yeah and also like how in the pursuit of this wealth what i also think is quite interesting is that he doesn't die in the end no he Goes mad. Unlike, yeah, he goes mad. Unlike all of, you know, the characters that we've previously talked about who, in their pursuit of lust, have died. I was about to say, do you think it's in connection to the fact that his pursuit is greed and not lust? Well, yeah. He doesn't well, get to die. Yeah, well, I think that... I just think that there is... Maybe. I just think... My, my only point is that, there, there, that yeah. there is a link between the concept of, like, immortality and money or commodity mm-hmm. um i just think that that is a link and i just think it's interesting that he 
he doesn't die. He doesn't, he doesn't suffer in that way that, you know, characters that we've looked at previously suffered. He suffers arguably in a worse way, mm-hmm. but he, he doesn't die. Um, he yeah. goes humanly mad instead of getting, uh, making a pact with some sort of demon or devil. Yeah. And that seems to be his kind of only goal. Like, he doesn't... I mean, you've said, and we will... We're literally about to talk about this, but... Upon, like, your your first reading of it, his interactions with Elisaveta, the fact that we never hear any of the love letters, the mm-hmm. fact that, like, they literally never... They meet once after he's killed the Countess. Yeah. And when he tells her... He tells the truth about what's happened. That's the only time that they ever interact. And she's obviously like, well, gross, go away. But, like, that is kind of... You know, that relationship that should be... Or, like, you know, if it was for example, like, Ambrosio or, like, Manfred, that, like, Lisa would be the goal. Yeah. Not the <laughs> secret. Yeah. Um, so he, he kind of doesn't really have this kind of... Uh, this this desire of in, in any kind of sexual way. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that is interesting because, like, she's obviously described as very beautiful. This has no effect on him, really. He's kind of, like, like you said, like, he's kind of, like, taken aback by by her when he sees her and he's like but his 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 reaction is to be like well this is how i get into the house to get the secret not like oh i found something greater than than money yeah but it, yeah i, I want to correct myself there when i said desire of the flesh he's got no desire for a woman's flesh like yeah. his desire for flesh is linked into the sort of like weird way that pushkin is sort of like correlating money and immortality or commodity immortality like he doesn't care about women though he just he's 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 money sexual baby he is Uh, money sexual that's what he wants and now to completely disregard all of that (laughs) (laughs) so so i asked myself when i was thinking about this i was like well spoken about for in the uncanny the uncanny often well like you know one big part of that is kind of freud's link to castration castration uh, male male sexuality the expression of that which is which is you know in the mind of a fully grown person who is you know relatively functional is kind of like warped into this sort of fear of of another delicate organ which is the eyes um so when he was writing his essays on the sandman it, which is the the text that he used to kind of formulate these ideas you know, all of the re- references to the eyes, he kind of said that this is uh, an example of the character's fear of castration. And it has nothing to do with money or greed or anything else like that. It's all about sex. So, <laughs> <laughs> applying that theory here, I was thinking, because I was, you know, writing up these notes, kind of thinking about for it in the end, and I was like, well, this doesn't really make, you know, it doesn't make 100% sense to just be like, well, he's only, he's only money sexual when there are kind of very clear i mean obviously this is before freud but i think it's interesting to do a freudian reading into this because i think that you can read this as being entirely about sex Mm -hmm. and the commodity and like the pursuit of wealth um and the pursuit of and and the pursuit of immortality is a metaphor for his pursuit of sexual gratification yeah and that you know, you could argue that he is just a sex creator, say Ambrosio or um, Manfred, and that it's it's all the whole story and the supernatural elements are really just a metaphor for his kind of repressed desires. When you think about it in that way, there are a lot of elements that kind of, I think, like, are kind of made more distinct. So, like, the fact that, like, the Countess, like, when he kind of, like goes to the countess like breaks into house um he kind of meets her like in the bedroom Mm -hmm. in her bedroom in kind of like you know whenever anything happens in the bedroom it's always about sex (laughs) Um, and he kind of like he kind of watches her undress um and kind of like the way that he's a voyeur in that way yeah he's very voyeuristic and like he sees lisa from afar um and kind of like has this moment for of her being too. Like, yeah. Well, this is the thing: is that I think that the whole thing is about Lisa Vetta, <laughs> mm-hmm. or at least I think it can be read in that way. And I think it's interesting to do so because that is the point of this podcast. But like, I think so. My theory is that he sees Lisa Vetta. He kind of like 
is taken back by her beauty, kind of falls madly in love with her, starts courting her, and then, you know, she invites him. She she invites him like into. There's obviously this really. Um, I'm really struggling to speak here. <laughs> <laughs> there's this really strong um, element of kind of like sexual innuendo because oh for he sure he says like for sure she, like he's like I really want to meet you. She's like fine, I'll meet you. He, and she's the one who like lets him in or like tells him how to get into the house. And he's meant to go to her bedroom. And you can only imagine that what either of them like are anticipating here is is sex. Yep. That that is what like kind of is gonna leaving. happen. It's yeah. not just like they're gonna meet and have a cup of tea. She like she says we're going to a ball. We'll be back at two o'clock in the morning. So yeah. Bloody late at night. Go into my bedroom and wait for me, and then I'll come and meet you there. Mm-hmm. So like there's this obvious like this anticipation of like sexual arti- activity but he doesn't go to her bedroom he goes to the countess where he watches the countess undress yeah is kind of horrified by her form and then she she dies and it's kind of like i kind of read that in a way of like instead of like seeking a kind of like uh moralistic kind of like courtship with lisa Vetta, instead he kind of like falls to his like baser instincts and like the kind of countess's body is kind of like this metaphor for his own kind of like sexual fiendishness. I would also argue that the interaction in the bedroom follows a sort of sexual arc as well. If you, if what you were walking in, you know, there's the sort of like a escalation of excitement that ends with him whipping out the pistol, <laughs> you know, like literally whipping point. out the pistol and then her dying. And then her dying and on like, yeah, like how... Well, I mean, in French, like, they call an orgasm, like, yeah. the little death. Little death. And off she goes. <laughs> off she goes. <laughs> a very happy lady. Um, <laughs> and then can't stay away because she has to go back to him as a ghost um, and give him just what he wants. Uh, so, yeah, I think you can definitely read it. So, you know, to say, like, he's completely money sexual. Is... He is. But he's also an incredibly randy little shit, is my point with that. I also think it is... Uh, relevant as well that it's a wink because it could very easily be a stare like he could like look upon her and her eyes could be open for a second he could be she could she could be staring at him as well but it's always a wink and i think a wink is a wink is uh, yeah a a wink is a little sultry but in sort of slightly more academic terms i would probably class wink winking as like an invitation or sort of um letting someone know uh that they're privy to knowledge that yeah. you're not which, which I guess is, is again yeah. that kind of element but of it's like also sexualized as well it's a sexualized action like to wink at it is I a don't sexualized know maybe you could do action. yeah you, I, I would say that a, a wink in any context is a bit saucy it was saucy but yeah no, I in think most that, contexts I think, anyway I think that you're right and I think that yeah that obviously like we were saying that how the eyes are like in Freud's mind anyway we kind of associate them now at least you know, this was obviously written a hundred years before Freud, but you know, with the kind of concept of like uh, castration and repression, repression. Yeah. Um, so you definitely like can read it in, into it that way. So yeah, should it's. We, uh, should we talk about the nationalities bit? Because I feel like yeah. it's a weird bit to tack on to the end. Well, no, I thought like I thought like well because like it's kind of related to sort of incest. Okay. So. I'm just checking. I think that bit is about incest. I don't think he should. But maybe she is he. Maybe he's talking about Tomsky. Well, no, because it's well. This is again a thing. It's ambiguous. So what Jamie is talking about here, which we're not explaining because <laughs> we just haven't thought it through enough. <laughs> uh, so let's start. Let's start with like the beginning. So like, is Herman German? Because the text. It details the fact that he his nationality his his uh, ancestry his father became a naturalized Russian, um, but he was German. There's no real mention of his mother. There's no mention of his mother. There's no mention of his mother apart from a weird bit that happens later on with the countess, which we'll go in we'll, we'll touch on in just like a hot second. But it talks about um, hold on, let me just find the yeah he's the son of a naturalized Russian. There's no mention of his mother. And from a contemporary standpoint, and also not just a contemporary standpoint, obviously like a West, you know, we're, we're English, a Western uh, standpoint, would we uh, consider him Russian? 
He's born in Russia. He kind of is always referred to as being German. And yeah. he's obviously given like the most German. And there's name also ever heard a of. prescription of certain traits uh, onto him. You know, he's described as the economical German as well. And I think that's also pretty important to consider where, you know, his 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 sort of numerical the numerical studying of threes throughout the text his obsession with sort of like being you know economy temperance industry all the rest of it and then he he gets the opportunity to sort of like make this like mad dash for for wealth which doesn't sound very german does it you know what i mean like in the way that the text is described uh, or prescribed a certain i suppose personality trait onto a whole nationality yeah and it's kind of interesting because the fact that he's german obviously is talked about constantly yeah it's also kind of like the thing that sort of it's one of those things that we didn't actually talk about but like you know thinking about him as a sort of uncanny figure like the fact that he's sort of this outsider like mm-hmm. the sort of outside figure who's not really like a part of you know the the russian culture in the same way that everyone even though he was like born and raised there um you know he's still German um and so that kind of like sets again is another thing that kind of like others him in a way and so that's that's kind of an interesting thing but then you get a part of the end which is again in the spirit of this book and in the spirit of Herman himself a very kind of ambiguous where he goes to the funeral and he looks of, of the countess and he he goes he goes up to the coffin the catafalque looks into the coffin that she's in mm-hmm. and he she supposedly like sees her wink at him she falls back he falls People, back he falls back uh, <laughs> she stays where imagine she yeah she just <laughs> falls out the bo- bottom of the coffin um and these two onlookers who we've never heard from before is described as like one of the countess's Chamberlain's is that what he's like? He's like one of the kind of stewards, or um, I don't know if I've necessarily got. I don't know if I've got it written. Maybe I can find it. Let me. Let me. Oh, uh, a a near relative of the deceased. A near relative of the deceased, Mm -hmm. of of the countess, says to an Englishman, which is a very random kind of again like drawing attention to nationalities. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't know who this Englishman is. This is the only time he's ever mentioned that that he is her that he is a natural her son. son a natural son of the countess is a the natural son of the countess direct quote so like is there is is he how would this character like, know that never, either as well well i suppose they're like a you know they're well he's related well this is the thing is that he the, the person who says that this mystery guy is related to the countess so the yeah. fact that he's then saying that is her son is like you know we never hear about herman's mother and also, like, I was quite interested by his in origin this. is is very sort is, of obfuscated, like in both in the way of like you know his nationality is a uh, sort of mixed, but like in a way that the text is like very purposefully trying to sort of present as um, muddled. But also, we have no idea where he goes. Like we have, you know, what I mean, like where mm. what he's doing when he's not just standing outside the window or, like, being weird or, like, plotting about... We don't know anything about his, like, upbringing or anything like that. So, like, you know, then we're kind of like, well... This is just a random nugget of information. It's just, yeah, it's just... It's it's never explained and you don't really know what to do with. Yeah. But I think it is interesting because he's obviously described as a naturalised Russian. And the term naturalised is interesting because, obviously, it means kind of, like, uh, assimilated, but also is kind of the term one uses when you're kind of trying to legitimise your illegitimate heirs. Yeah. And so there's kind of, again, that element of, like, is this character an illegitimate... You know, what What? What are the kind of sexual circumstances that had led to this person, like, being in this situation? Mm-hmm. And it seems like a German fucked a countess and then kind of, like... You know, because again, he's rubbing shoulders with all of these this royalty, mm-hmm. and yet he has no money himself. Yeah. So it's like, why is yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is up with Herman? Yeah, yeah. What is up with Herman? Where did he come from? Maybe he was pirating with fucking. Maybe he was. <laughs> what was his name? Theodore. <laughs> 
there's just one bit I want to look up because it might be relevant, but I also don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. Yeah. Anyway, the point that I was looking for. Yeah. I don't. I don't know why I spent that long looking at it because uh-huh. I literally it was the bit that you said earlier. Where he's kind of talking about these three crimes mm. that are on his conscience, mm. which Tomsky never explains. But like that would be like being an illegitimate son like would make sense in yeah. that context if he kno- knows about it and yeah doesn't really say anything which brings us on to the incest because then he, he then goes into the countess's bedroom and obviously has this kind of like as jamie pointed out highly sexualized yeah. interaction with her yeah watches her undress draws his weapon uh, <laughs> considers like considers getting with her before he realizes oh it's gonna take too long yeah he does like that's he, he oh, like he does like his, his his initial plan is like well i'll woo the countess yeah not i'll woo lisa Vessa, but he's just like that might take too long she's really old so i'm just gonna woo lisa Vessa. And he sees lisa Vessa does get compromised by kind of how he thinks he's uh, she's pretty and then he's like nah, well i still want the money more well the money still is the the, the principal interest to me yeah so Super incesty. Well, Super we, incesty. We're landing on this point, this closing point, a lot. Right in the end. Yeah. It always has to end with some incest. <laughs> I like that. You know, we actually haven't discussed which which book we're going to do next. Is it going to be the Telltale Heart? We're either going to think we think we're going to do um, the Telltale Heart or the Cast or uh, Cast of Amontillado, which I prefer. No, let's make a decision. What what we're going to do? Let's do at the least cask, make a decision on one. Cast of Amontillado. I think we should do. What's it called? <laughs> the Cask of Amontillado. Is that one? The Cask of Amontillado. I would, right. Never mind. I'm not going to detail which one it is here because um, we'll probably do the whistle stop tour of it in the next episode. You can go so. and read it. Yeah. And send us your thoughts on it. It's very short. 46 listeners out there and not one of you have written in yet. So you're slacking, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> We're do, doing all the work here. <laughs> um, as always, I will leave um, email in the description in the description box so if you did want to go and uh read that story it's a short story so you've got no excuse now it's not like reading a fucking whole novel (laughs) um (laughs) go and do so and let us know what you think i'll also leave the description in in the description the link to the queen of spades the version that we read uh for anyone who wants to reference it go back and read it Mm because obviously we were meant to do the Italian this time. Um, <laughs> so you had no warning whatsoever. Yeah. Um, that will all be in the description. And uh, yeah, yeah it, we will be back in in two weeks. We promise we'll be on time with the Casco Montiardo. Hell yeah. Yeah. In the meantime, stay spooky. Have a great day. See you guys. Bye. Let's go to the pub. <laughs> yeah, now let's go and go to the pub. <laughs>